This is Tall Tale TV, your podcast for sci-fi and fantasy short stories. Of Tyrants and Tea Kettles by Leslie Heron. Chapter 23, Diaspiros. The haunting siren call of finding her parents pulled Piper along, undeterred by the lead weight in her chest. The sky was bright, and a warm breeze kept the bracing smell of the docks at bay. She and her brother were leaving this nightmare of a life behind to be reunited with the only people who had ever loved them. But despite all that, she couldn't shake the sour taste of lying to her brother. At one end of the docks, signaled by a series of flag colors she recognized, was their ticket to freedom. A long, sleek airship, adorned with brass furnishings, glittered in the afternoon sun. Above it hung three individual balloons that appeared to have been recently replaced. Even the paint along the hall looked fresh. The Inquisitor had not skimped with his promise and had set her up with one of the upper-class ships on the side of the docks reserved for the rich. Atticus climbed under the dividing rails that separated the wealthy folk from the commoners. Look at the size of the sails on that one! Piper turned with a sigh to see her brother drawing a rather irksome look from the well-dressed individuals around them. It was obvious the two of them didn't belong, and the locals made no attempt to make them feel welcome, with or without a ticket. Piper looked in the direction her brother was indicating. Even with her limited view, she could still tell the ship was indeed a massive monstrosity of engineering. Military banners were plastered against every available surface. She stood in awe for a moment, taking in the sheer size of the vessel. When she returned her attention back to her brother, however, he was gone. Panic flooded her system, and she spun on her heel, scanning up and down the docks, before she saw him emerge on the other side of the barrier. Atticus had pushed his way through the crowd to stand in front of a rusted shipping freighter, gushing over its metal propellers. She let out a sigh of relief and looked down at the folder clutched in her hands. She chanced one last peek at the old photograph of her mother, and a smile broke over her features. Instilled with a rush of courage, she closed the folder with a snap and hopped the barrier to retrieve her brother. He was attempting to climb the rigging of the rusted ship to investigate the dirigible. Shaking her head, Piper marched across the busy docks to reach him. She stuck out a hand and tugged against his pant leg. That's not the ship we're taking. Atticus jumped off the rope and landed neatly next to his sister. Oh, but I like the navigation system of this one. He pointed at a helm which was clearly from a different ship, riveted crudely into place and heavily modified. It's like they combined three ships into one. Piper shook her head. The vessel he was gesturing to did indeed look like that was the case. Trust her brother to gush over something that looked like a floating trash heap when they had tickets for one of the nicest ships she had ever seen. She grabbed his hand and began to tug him toward the end of the docks. Listen, we have to take a particular ship, okay? Oh, I didn't tell you yet. It was supposed to be a surprise, but... She held up the folder. I think I found Mom and Dad. She watched as her brother fell silent, and a vacant expression took over his face. She could tell his mind was trying to come to terms with this information, and for a brief moment, Piper was worried he might decline. He had been so young, he probably didn't have much memory of them after all. You found Mom and Dad? The gentle desperation in his voice echoed what Piper felt in her heart. She couldn't fight the wide grin that broke out onto her face as she held back a choked sob. Yes, and we're gonna go find them. The look of shocked awe on Atticus's face melted away into an ecstatic smile. It's been so long. Do you think we could show them my inventions? Do you think they would like that? Of course we can, but we gotta hurry if we're gonna make it on time. Piper turned to steer her brother back towards their ship, when something caught her eye just beyond his shoulder. A flash of red fabric and a glint of steel forcing its way through the crowd near the lift exit. 
She swallowed the lump in her throat and turned to quicken her step, hauling Atticus along with her. She might have made it if her brother hadn't turned to see what she was looking at and waved the damned cyborg down with his floppy hat. Piper, wait! Vel called out against the din of the passengers and livestock. Come on, Atticus, let's go! Piper tightened her grip on her brother's hand and pulled harder against him. It was, however, a futile gesture. The cyborg had seen them and rushed ahead to cut her off before they could make their escape. Beads of sweat were dripping down his face as he doubled over, clutching a stitch in his side. Vel straightened up, sucking in one last lungful of air. Listen, Piper, you were right, okay? The High Inquisitor is up to something, and it's not good. He turned to face the boy. He has your friend. He has Berg. Piper shuffled her feet nervously and forced a fake chuckle as she gently squeezed her brother's hand, trying to move them around Vel. Of course Berg's at the college. She narrowed her gaze, giving the cyborg a dangerous glare. Tragedy and comedy said they would look after him. Vel studied the girl for a moment, shaking his head in disbelief. Oh, they're looking after him all right, all the way to the workshop where he's going to be dismantled. Piper let out another high laugh. That's nonsense. I'm sure they're just taking him somewhat to keep him safe. Atticus tugged his hand free from his sisters and looked at her. Concern tugged his happy features into a frown. Piper, I'm worried now. Can we go see if Berg's okay first? A small smile twitched the corner of his mouth. Then we can come back here and take the ship. No! Piper cleared her throat with a cough as her brother recoiled from her exclamation. I mean, we can't. The ship leaves very soon, and if we miss it, we won't be able to find Mom and Dad. Genuine tears were sparkling in her eyes. Her desperation warred with the heartbreak of knowing what her brother would say if he found out the truth. She could feel the hope of reuniting her entire family slipping through the cracks of her tight grip. Atticus put a consoling hand on his sister's shoulder. Piper, I want to see Mom and Dad as much as you do. I miss them every day, but they have been gone for a really long time. They can wait a bit longer. Berg needs me now. He's just a robot! Piper watched as those words hit Atticus harder than any slap the Inquisitor had delivered. Atticus gave her a stern look, seeming far more mature than he had been moments before. He's my friend, and he needs my help. Atticus pulled his hand away to offer her his hat. It'll be okay. I'll come right back. Hold on to that for me, okay? Tears began to roll down Piper's cheeks as she watched her brother turn away from her and fall in line with a merging crowd heading for the lift. She returned her attention to the cyborg, the familiar hatred of betrayal bubbling up inside her chest. You promised! I did, and I'm trying to keep the both of you safe. Well took a step closer, his demeanor softening. Listen, you were right about everything, and... I really am sorry, but do you think that Elias is just going to let you abscond with Atticus like this? He reached out and grabbed her shoulders with both hands. Your brother is probably the only person alive smarter than him, and if he doesn't see Atticus as an ally, then he's a threat. The Inquisitor will hunt the two of you down and drag you back here, or worse. Piper hated that she couldn't stop the tears that were streaming down her cheeks. I was just doing... What you thought was best? Mel chimed in as he pulled away. That sounds more like Elias talking than the girl who risked her life to help a stranger. His brows knitted together as he gave her one last look and stepped around her to catch up with the boy. A weakness took hold and Piper collapsed to her knees. She clutched the folder tight to her chest as she sobbed like a broken child. She had lost the trust of her friend. Her brother had run off to save a rusty invention, and her hope of finding her mother was slipping away from her. 
Nobody gave her a second glance as she sat on the filthy dock, attempting to find some form of composure. Pull yourself together, she thought as she dragged the back of her hand against her face. Atticus needs your help. These words railed against her as she stiffened her resolve and pulled herself to her feet. Berg may be just a walking junk heap, but it was important to Atticus, and that should be enough for her. Piper dusted her knees and turned to face the crowd that her brother and the cyborg had disappeared through. If she hurried, she might be able to catch the lift. She made to step forward, but a cold, rusted metal hook slid down around her shoulder, holding her in place. Fate be a fickle mistress, but she's smiling down on me today. Captain Leon let out a sinister cackle as he grabbed her by the scalp and hauled her backwards. Welcome aboard the Night Reaver, Missy. Are you sure we shouldn't have checked the hangar first? What if Berg's not here? Atticus was chewing at his fingers as he followed the cyborg's quickened steps down the university corridor. The first time Bill had walked these long halls, they felt impressive, larger than life. Now they seemed to close in around him, each door covering some dark secret. He's here, I'm sure of it. He rounded a corner and recognized the familiar metal door at the end of a long hall. He marched up to it, and with what strength he could muster, he rammed the door with the heavy sole of his boot. The door swung open and slammed into the wall with a resounding crash. Bell stepped inside, a surge of anger filling him as he drew the attention of every living creature within. Through a crowd of dozens of technicians and researchers, he could make out the prototype robots being moved closer to the large metal platform that sat in the middle of the room. Elias stood there, directing the flow of construction as if he were a music conductor. Oh dear, you're back already. He waved the awestruck workers back into motion as he stepped off the metal plinth. He pulled a silver pocket watch from his waistcoat and examined it. Although I'm not entirely sure why you have returned, and you've caused young Atticus here to miss his flight. He retired his watch back to his pockets before folding his hands behind his back as he stopped in front of them. What can I do for you this time? Atticus paused as he squinted against the throngs of moving people. A break in the crowd revealed a glimmer of brass, and his heart skipped a beat. A familiar metal body lay splayed across a large table. Its eyes were dark, and a tumble of wires cascaded from its cranium like spilled pasta. Berg! Atticus lunged past the Inquisitor, shoving him out of the way and stumbling through the crowd. He crashed hard into the table and reached out, cradling the empty face of his best friend. What did you do? Comedy began stalking towards him, but stopped at a gesture from Elias, who then turned and called after the boy. Atticus, I had to. This is what is best. Berg will serve a greater purpose this way. He will save countless lives and go down in history as a hero. Isn't that worth the cost? Vel took a step forward, lowering his voice. Stop this. Now. You have to believe me. This, this utopia you want will not end well. They never do. He reached out, using his mechanical hand to turn the Inquisitor to face him. Elias let out a tired sigh. True peace is an illusion, so long as there are those who both oppose the current rule of law and have the power to do so. He paused and looked over his shoulder at the growing number of robots being attended to by the mass of scientists. By removing the power to resist, I will put an end to the bloodshed and release my people from poverty and strife. They will know everlasting peace. Vel bristled. It can't be obtained by force. You're describing a prison, not a paradise. He relinquished his grip on the Inquisitor's arm. Put an end to this charade. Now, or I will tear it all down. Brick by brick if I have to. This isn't you. I know you better than this. Elias cocked a brow as he pulled away. You know nothing about me. I am not your brother, and you are certainly not mine. If you choose to see my legacy as a prison, that is your call. But it is my empire to rule, not yours. 
A sneer curled the corners of his lips. Vel looked over at Atticus, who was struggling to keep from breaking down as he gently scooped bits of Berg back inside his shell. He returned his narrowed gaze on the Inquisitor. Not everyone is powerless to resist. He flexed the fingers of his mechanical hand before clenching them into a fist, which whipped around and caught Elias across the face. A spurt of blood erupted from his nose, and his glasses shattered against his skull. Comedy was instantly at the Inquisitor's side, who had collapsed onto one knee. She put up her hands in a defensive stance, ready to fend off another attack. Elias's mouth turned into a genuine smile as he pushed a finger gingerly against his nose. Blood continued to run down his chin despite his efforts to stem the flow. Not my brother indeed. You have a spine. How interesting. The smile faded as he pushed himself to his feet and pulled a cloth from his pocket, wiping the blood away from his face. The sigh that escaped him was almost sad. Interesting, but unfortunate. I believe you, and as such, you represent a threat to my people's future. He turned his back on the cyborg, waving somewhat absent-mindedly over his shoulder. Tragedy, dispose of him. Vel spun, too late, as the hulking man who had moved behind him sunk a fist into his gut. All the air in his lungs exploded outward, doubling him over around tragedy's fist. A second blow struck the side of his temple, dazing him and sending him to the ground in a heap. Tragedy reached down and grasped Vel by the neck with one massive hand, hauling him halfway to standing, and started dragging him towards a far wall of the room. Atticus heard the scuffle and pried his eyes away from Berg to see his other friend being dragged towards a massive circular grate in the floor. He may not have been allowed on the campus on a regular basis, but he had been here long enough to know what that pipe was and where it led. Throwing caution to the wind, he pulled away from the table and lunged towards tragedy, raining a flurry of untrained punches against the man's torso. Let my friend go! Oxygen saturation levels dangerously low. Vel's mechanical hand clawed at Tragedy's fingers, but his grip was like iron. He could feel the blood vessels in his good eye building with pressure, and he knew it wouldn't be long before he passed out. He began kicking blindly at the brute's legs, but without stable footing under him, the attacks simply glanced off. Tragedy chuckled and shook Vel violently as he came to a stop at the grate. Stop struggling. I want to enjoy this. He leaned over and plucked the cover off as if it were made of paper. The smell of discarded chemicals and waste oil plumed up from the large pit, stinging Vel's nostrils. With a show of unnatural strength, tragedy dragged the cyborg off his feet and dangled him over the exposed pipe. Now, let's watch that light leave your eyes, yeah? The grip that had already nearly crushed Vel's windpipe began to constrict with an impossible power. The metal plates in his neck began to pop and bend beneath the pressure, and he was sure he felt something dislocate in his throat. Atticus, realizing his punches were doing nothing to stop the bodyguard, leapt out over the open pit and latched on to tragedy's extended arm. His plan worked. The sudden shift in weight was enough to haul the bodyguard forward, causing him to lose his footing and relinquish the grip on the cyborg. Then, Atticus realized his plan had worked a little too well. He and Vel were now shoulder-deep in the blackness of the pit, praying their grip would hold. Swinging his free arm in a wild arc, Tragedy managed to catch hold of the grate and prevent himself from entering the hole as well. But the other two bodies were now clutching his other wrist, writhing and bucking as they tried to climb up him. Elias, realizing what had just happened, shoved Comedy away and began charging across the room towards them. Atticus! Vel felt his body slam into the walls of the pipe as tragedy attempted to shake them loose. He watched as Atticus, unable to withstand the impact, lost his grip and fell. He crunched into the angled wall of the shaft, and despite his feverish attempts to hang on, slid down the slimy embankment, disappearing into the void. Vel cursed and glared back up at the tortured porcelain mask of tragedy before relaxing his fingers and falling into the darkness himself.
After a short, painful ride along the slick stone, Vel found himself airborne, free-falling in the pitch black. He reached out in every direction, still gasping for air and windmilling his arms trying to find purchase before he impacted the hard ground. But instead of the stone floor he had been bracing for, Vel plunged beneath the surface of rushing water, gulping in a lungful of the foul, tainted liquid. He burst above the surface, hacking and coughing up the acidic liquid, his throat and lungs burning as much from the chemicals as the water. The flow of the water gave him no reprieve, and as the giant underground trench curved around a corner, Vel felt his body crumple against the stone wall like a rag doll, before being torn away and tossed beneath the water again. Kicking his legs, Vel swam his way back to the surface and took a deep breath before bellowing, Atticus! No response. He squinted in the dark for a flash of movement other than his own. Amy, find him! Vel's artificial intelligence clicked on the night vision overlay of his cybernetic eye just in time for him to brace before hitting another bend. This time, as he was forced under, he caught the sight of a pair of feet kicking several yards ahead of him. Vel ignored the screaming of his lungs and put on a burst of speed, kicking and clawing his way towards the boy. Reaching out, he managed to catch a pant leg and reeled him in closer until he could grasp Atticus around the waist and haul them both upwards. As they broke the surface, they sputtered and gasped for air. Despite the night vision laying out the contents of the tunnel, Vel didn't notice the large metal frame of a discarded machine until it was nearly upon him. He managed to pull the boy to the side, out of the way, but with no proper footing, it only forced himself farther into the path of the structure. He cried out as a jagged piece of metal dug its way across his back, slicing him open. Damage detected. Extreme blood loss imminent. Vel grit his teeth against the pain and pulled the boy close, looking around wildly at the subterranean shaft that the river ran through. It was man-made and judging by the caustic nature of the liquid, likely served as a way to dump chemicals and other refuse. His AI highlighted a structure up ahead. It was a ledge that ran the length of one side and was several feet above the surface. It looked as though it might be a service access for clearing blockages. Vel saw another bend approaching and prepared, grabbing Atticus by the back of his coat. Get ready to grab hold of the wall! What wall? Smack! As they impacted, Vel pulled up with all his might, hauling Atticus high enough that he could reach the edge. As his own body crumpled face first into the stone surface, he could feel the tear in his back rip even wider and was blinded by pain. Chemicals stung the raw flesh as blood poured from the wound. But as Vel was swept around the corner, he could see that Atticus had been lucky and managed to find the lip of the stone ledge with his left hand and was already attempting to pull himself free. Despite the pain ravaging his body, Vel attempted to dig his mechanical hand against the man-made wall. He felt a jolt as his fingers found purchase in a small crevice between two stone slabs. The hinge point stopped his movement, but also forced him beneath the water once again. As his AI flashed a warning about his depleting oxygen levels, Vel struggled to pull himself free. He could feel his tenuous grip slipping, and just as his fingers were about to give way, something grabbed hold of his jacket and hauled him up onto the ledge. He sputtered and vomited lungfuls of water across the stone. He cracked open his eyes. Atticus was lying splayed on the ground several yards away, his chest heaving. Relief washed over him as he felt the joints in his arms and knees begin to buckle. Someone smacked Vel hard on the back. Through the searing pain, another pint of water was forced to vacate his lungs. He looked over his shoulder, blinking away the spots of color to see the smiling face of Alphonse. I had a feeling I might find the two of you down here, Al said, offering the cyborg a conspiratorial wink. Of Tyrants and Tea Kettles is book two of the ongoing Psy Fantasy series by author Leslie Heron. Join us as the adventure unfolds, with new chapters releasing every few weeks. How about the seagull? The seagull? 
That's a horrible name for a ship. Says the guy who proposed the Pegasus. Oi, the Pegasus is a majestic creature. Ah, blue parrot, blue parrot. Ooh, I like the sounds of that. Hey, boys? No, yeah, 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 okay. I suppose okay. it does have a ring to it. Listen here, you dogs. I told you it's named the Night Reaver, and that's final. Now deal with it. Arr, but isn't that a bit derivative? Oh, I know. How about the peg leg? Oh, shut up, Scribner. <laughs>